Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the statue. This statue, or bust, is said to have been made by a man named William, who enjoyed making these sorts of things out of clay. Unfortunately, however, legend goes that this specific statue was made on the same day that William was crushed to death during a tragic work accident. A co-worker of his who showed up to work the following day found that this statue was still there, so he took it home with him. For a while, he kept the statue hidden, but when he took it out to display it, things started to go awry. It started with just a heavy and uninviting feeling, but soon things escalated. He began to hear doors slamming on their own, only to go and find them wide open. If anything was placed next to the statue, the next time he would find it completely shattered, and at one point he found the statue in a position that he never placed it in. He finally had the last straw when he saw a dark, shadowy figure, or a sort of mist, moving around near where he placed the statue. After this, he was so spooked he had a friend list the item for him on eBay because he just simply needed to get rid of it. In our number 9 spot today, we have Aluru Rock. Aluru Rock is a large sandstone formation that is located in the southern part of the Northern Territory in Australia. It is sometimes known as Ayers Rock, but regardless of what it is called, this area is sacred for the people indigenous to the land. This is part of the reason that those who visit the rock are asked to not take anything from the site. Despite this, people of course still choose to smuggle pieces of the rock out of the area and home with them. Other than the bad karma and just in general feeling like a bad person for doing the one thing you're asked not to do, as it turns out, this rock may hold a more sinister secret. Those who have stolen rocks from the Uluru have experienced things like extremely bad luck, severe illness, and sometimes even the death of those they love. The curse these rocks hold is seemingly so bad that it is very common for the company that runs the tours of the formation to receive letters of apology that contain the stolen rocks. Apparently these letters come so often, at least one a day is expected. Maybe this is a weird coincidence, but it seems to be happening a little too often for that to be the explanation. In our number 8 spot today, we have the beds. Back in 1986, couple Deborah and Alan Tolman moved into a new home with their children in Wisconsin. The following year, they bought a second-hand set of bunk beds for their kids for a hundred bucks, but as it would turn out, they bought much more than they had originally bargained for. When they brought the bunk beds into their home, they clearly must have brought something else along with it. It started when they began to see strange shapes in their home, and they would hear disembodied voices that, despite how hard they tried, they could not find the source of. They found themselves fighting with clocks and radios that turned on by themselves, they would find furniture that had moved seemingly all by itself, and sometimes they'd even see an apparition of an old woman. In the end, they not only threw the beds in the landfill, but they also moved from the home just to be safe. As far as we know, the beds remained in the landfill, but who's to say for sure? In our number 7 spot today, we have the Terracotta Army. The Terracotta Army was discovered in China, and it is a massive piece of funerary art that is thought to be one of the most massive archaeological finds of modern times. It truly is incredible, and it's something that's been attracting tourists from all over the world since its discovery, but for those who did the discovering, well, Things haven't been going so well. In 1974, there were seven farmers who happened to stumble upon this huge discovery, and you would think that this would come with some kind of a reward, but instead, things have been going terribly for them. Soon after the discovery, the government claimed their farmland. After this, their homes were demolished in order to make way for the exhibition halls and gift shops that were to come. They didn't just get nothing for the discovery, they ended up losing because of it. This is exactly why many people believe that perhaps with the unearthing of this huge piece of art, they also dug up some sort of curse that was buried long ago. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Myrtle's Plantation Mirror. Myrtle's Plantation is located in St. Francisville, Louisiana, and it is said to be one of the most haunted places in the entire world, which seems like that would make a lot of sense. One of the reasons for this spooky reputation is because of a mirror that resides inside of it. It is said that this mirror holds the spirit of Sarah Woodruff and two of her children. Legend goes that a woman named Chloe was a slave at the plantation, and she drew up a sort of plan to get revenge on the owners of it, Sarah and her husband. Chloe baked a cake full of poison for them, but in the end, the rest of the family, except for the husband, ended up consuming the poisonous cake. When they passed away, it is said that their spirits went into the only mirror that was uncovered at the time, thus this haunted mirror was born. People who have since visited the plantation have claimed to see the family in the reflection, as well as handprints on the glass, despite 
the continuous polishing. In our number five spot today, we have tap shoes. These tap shoes were listed on eBay and they are cute as can be. They're black shiny ones with a red bow to tie them together. They look recital ready, but apparently they haven't been used in a long time and the reason behind it all is chilling. Legend goes that these shoes once belonged to a little girl who loved to dance. At some point, the shoes were retired and she would go on to meet an untimely fate. The shoes ended up being placed with other old the shoes ended up being placed with other old memento items and put in a closet and sort of forgotten about. The shoes, as well as the other items with it, ended up being part of an estate sale years later, but the spirit of the person who passed may have already had some other ideas about what they wanted to happen to the shoes. The seller of the shoes reported that there were mysterious happenings surrounding the shoes as they were clearing out their late aunt's house, the person who was the owner of the shoes. They explained that there were mysterious knocking sounds coming from from inside of the closet, almost as if the shoes were tapping by themselves. Also, as it turns out, the house had quite a gruesome history that included killings. So if not the ant's ghost, perhaps there's another one lurking somewhere in there. In our number four spot today, we have the dark mirror. This mirror now resides with the traveling museum of the paranormal and the occult, but prior to that, this mirror was received from the owner who had purchased it from a psychic fair. It is believed that this mirror was created sometime around the 1820s or 30s, and it is actually quite beautiful to look at, despite the sinister things it seems to hold. The owner who gave it to the museum explained that every time they peered into the mirror, they saw these extremely upsetting things while looking into the dark mirror's reflection. The museum has said that since they added the mirror to their collection, there have been guests who have also reported the same kind of things. Guests have claimed to see things reflected back at them like sightings of their own corpse. In our number three spot today, we have the water jug. Okay, estate sales are weird places. There are weird things there, some quirky items, but this has got to be one of the strangest on a whole bunch of different levels. It's a decorative drinking jug, but it's being held in a miniature cart that's being pulled by a porcelain donkey. I truly could not make that item up, nor could I make up the fact that this kitschy item is also apparently haunted. The seller of this item spoke about how he grew up with the item around as it was always displayed at his grandmother's house and that she always kept it full of water. This was all fine and dandy until after she passed away and he was taking care of the estate and he bumped into it. How was this jug filled with water when no one was there to fill it? He thought that perhaps it was just old leftover water and he just ignored it, but the same thing seemed to happen repeatedly. And it wasn't even like the water level was staying the same. It would increase seemingly all on its own. The seller decided that this was not an item that they wanted to hold on to and decided it would be best to pass on to someone who was ready to take on this mysterious, strange object. In our number two spot today, we have Letta the doll. Before we really dive into this one, can we just acknowledge how all cursed dolls look like they would be a cursed doll. I mean like Annabelle, Robert, they both totally look like dolls that would be holding a secret scary curse. And this doll, Letta, is just another one that we can add to that list. Letta is a doll that is said to be around 200 years old and is extremely cursed. This doll is called Letta for short as its full name is Letta Me Out. Really clever. The doll was originally found underneath a house, which definitely feels like the origin story of a haunted doll. The creepy discovery came 47 years ago. Letta still lives with the man who found him. The hauntings of Letta include things like the doll walking around on its own at night, the owners finding objects around the house that have been moved into odd places. Some people have even seen Letta move right in front of their own eyes, and the owner also reports finding little doll sized scuff marks around the home as well. It is said that this doll once belonged to someone who passed away while holding it, thus their spirit became trapped inside of the doll. Apparently one day in an interview about Letta, as the interviewer was asking questions about the person who passed, the doll began to move in her lap. Yeah, no thank you. Letta has his own Instagram and Facebook page in case you want to hear more about all of the creepiness surrounding this cursed doll. In our number one spot today, we have the mask. This metal mask resembles the face of a monkey. It's definitely already a little strange looking, but the story is even more interesting. According to the seller of this item, they explained that they acquired this mask in Thailand, but not before they experienced a supernatural battle where a witch used spells to bind the spirit of a djinn to the mask, trapping it in. 
Since then, the mask is said to be full of supernatural powers, some of which could bring benefits, but it takes a whole pile of work. This mask is said to have the ability to fend off vampires as well as potentially bring riches to its owner, but it needs some things in return. The entity in the mask needs regular offerings of food and drink, and it also requires the owner to meditate in front of it for 20 minutes, three times a day. Talk about high maintenance. If a person refuses to do these things while in possession of the mask, it is said that a cruel fate awaits them. I mean, what do you expect when you anger an ancient spirit? Kicking off the list at number 10. British Museum's Adult Room. Okay, young ones, hide your eyes, here we go. We'll kick this list off on a scandalous note. The British Museum, they have a long lost adult themed room, to put it lightly. The museum itself dates back to the mid 1700s. In its initial opening, the museum only let 10 people in at a time. Now, of course, it holds many more people every day, but some collections, not everybody can handle. In the Victorian era, the museum had a secret room for obscene objects, or objects that are deemed perverse. There's a part of a temple wall that shows, you know, the dirtiest deed being done. In the collection includes a Roman terracotta lamp that depicts a naked woman on a crocodile. Number nine, flesh eating beetle room. Okay, enough about ancient butts. Let's move on to the weird, shall we? Chicago's Field Museum. This one's chock full of secret rooms. I'll mention one more on this list later on, but I have to include the flesh-eating beetle room. The Field Museum uses real hide beetles to clean its specimens in order to get each of these carcasses ready for showtime. These beetles are on the clock. They're business-oriented. In just a few hours, a small rodent can be completely cleaned. Number eight, Naples Secret Adult Room. Okay, we can all agree that last one was pretty disgusting, so I'll liven up the mood once again with some scandalous Pompeii excavations. After the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, the small city of Pompeii was of course covered in hot ash. Now the ancient Roman ruin is still being uncovered today, but back in the 1700s, most of the lost city was excavated for the first time in history. And the king of Naples got the best of the best, right? Who's first up, first dibs. Most of the contents are now kept in the archeological museum in Naples, but some have to be held in the secret room. In the past, you had to receive permission from the king himself to take a quick peek at the sensual art. In our number seven spot today, we have the Crying Children paintings. These paintings were a series created by an Italian painter who was known as Giovanni Breglin, but his name was really Bruno Amarillo. Bruno was born in Venice in 1911 and fought in World War II, which ended up being the inspiration for a lot of his paintings. During his time in the war, he saw a lot of suffering, and this is where he got the idea for the series of Crying Children paintings. After the paintings were sold, there began to be reports of fires in all of the places where the paintings were held. While this could have just been a strange coincidence, the weirdest part is that the paintings always remained intact while everything else around them was burned. This quickly became the most talked about thing and was on the front of every newspaper, and the paintings quickly gained the nickname Diablo. It caused the paintings to end up being replicated and mass produced, but none of the replicas hold quite the same powers as the originals. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Goddess Statue. The Goddess of Death statue the statue is also known as the Woman from the Lem. This artifact was made out of limestone and it was created somewhere around 3500 BC and was found in Cyprus in 1878. Over the years it has belonged to many different families who all have been ruined and dismantled by death. After the first six years of ownership, all seven members of the first family died. It then moved on to a second owner and after four years, death began to come to him and his family as well. There was then a long period where it was unclaimed, but once the third family finally got a hold of it, several members of that family began to die as well. The third family ended up turning it over to the Royal Scottish Museum because it is, of course, an ancient relic, but legend goes that the museum curator who initially took care of it died within a year of receiving it. So maybe the curse lives on. In our number five spot today, we have the goblet. This is an item that was found in a museum, but it was a museum of specifically haunted things, so I feel like it still counts. This goblet is said to have been used for rituals of necromancy, which poses a few questions for me personally. What did they put in it and presumably drink out of it? Holy water, wine, blood, all the above? Who knows? Either way, here's the real kicker. This goblet was of course for sale on eBay because why not? And the seller was claiming that it has an amazing energy to it. Okay. What kind of energy? Well, they said that some find it strangely positive, but that many perceive it as negative and malignant. All right, 
don't think I'll be bidding on that auction, to be perfectly honest. In our number four spot today, we have the Surrey Ghost Car. On December 11th, 2002, a call came into the Surrey Police Department. The caller reported that they had just seen a car lose control and run off the road and then presumably crash. It was, of course, an emergency call, but not necessarily anything out of the ordinary. That was until authorities got to the location and realized that they couldn't find any evidence of a crash. They kept searching and ended up finding a maroon colored car that was nose down in a ditch nearby, but this car was covered in so much undergrowth that it must have been here for months. This meant that somehow this crash went undetected for five months and worst of all, so did the body that lay nearby. Using dental records, they were able to identify the body as a man who had been wanted for robbery since July of that year. It is said that the sighting of the car leaving the road was a ghostly replay of the events that had taken place five months prior. In our number three spot today, we have doorknobs. To be honest, I wasn't expecting to ever hear about haunted doorknobs, but this might just be a thing that really does exist. These doorknobs were listed on eBay, and the seller explained that they were once the knobs seen on the doors at an asylum, which truly lands on the list of creepiest places in the world. Considering everything that is said to have gone on at places like these, it truly doesn't surprise me one bit. We're looking at you, lobotomies and other horrific mental health treatments of the past. These doorknobs must have quite literally opened the door to some terrifying things that I'm sure many of us would prefer to not even think about. According to the eBay listing, the asylum that they came from after it was abandoned is said to have had strange whispers, occurrences, and horrifying noises coming from it. This is all to say that maybe that trip to Home Depot is better than buying antique. Just this one time. In our number two spot today, we have the Nightmare Doll. Haunted dolls like Annabelle and even Robert get a lot of hype, but they certainly aren't the only dolls with stories of curses and hauntings behind them. This Nightmare Doll was listed for sale on eBay, and according to the seller, the doll is possessed by a Dibuk, which is a malicious demon or entity. The seller of the doll is actually someone who apparently specializes in selling these sort of paranormal items that no one wants anymore. The seller explained that the owner of the doll bought it at an antique shop, and while they did tell her about what the doll held, she didn't know what the word meant, so she took it anyways. Soon after purchasing it, she realized that anyone who came into contact with the doll was then plagued with terrifying nightmares and occurrences of these sort of shadow people. She only could handle this all for a couple of months before she handed the doll over for it to be sold and moved far, far away from her. In our number one spot today, we have the carving. This is a carving that was sold on eBay in 2013, which the sellers claimed had been in their family for over 60 years. It was originally found by the seller's grandparents in the attic of their home. This was back in the 1950s, and when it was found, the grandparents asked the original owners of the home where it had come from. They explained that it was a gift from a prisoner who was said to have carved it. The seller explained in their post that, quote, anyone who comes in contact with it seems to feel strange or creeped out by it. The statue mostly didn't cause too much harm. That was until the seller tried to put it on display in their home. Once it was taken out of an old box and placed in a cabinet, strange occurrences began. They said that, quote, I began to experience the television turning off and on, lights coming on in rooms no one was in, the kids' toys coming on in the middle of the night in their room at 3 a.m. At the end of the day, despite the troubles this person had with the statue, they still ended up selling it for 85 bucks. Not a bad deal. Go rid of a demon and gain some cash for it. Starting us off at number 10, the toy monkey. So it goes without saying that almost everything that is a notable part of the Conjuring series is also a real artifact that the Warrens found along the way. One of these such artifacts, who made an appearance in both The Conjuring and the spin off Annabelle Comes Home, is the toy monkey. However, if it wasn't already obvious, it's not something to be played with. As Ed tells the reporters in The Conjuring movie, everything you see here is either haunted, cursed, or been used in some kind of ritualistic practice. Nothing is a toy. Not even the toy monkey. So what exactly makes this monkey so scary in real life? Well, allegedly, it is possessed by a terrifying demon who enjoys stalking its victims before eventually killing them. So, yeah, not a very nice monkey, it seems. Although, nothing you'll find in this museum is terribly friendly. Coming in at number nine, a vampire coffin. As far as creepy looking things go, I have to say this is not one of the scariest looking on the list, but of course, 
things are not always what they appear. This coffin found at the Warrens Museum is not just called the Vampire Coffin because of the slightly goofy looking Count Dracula face on the top, but because it was allegedly actually used by a modern day vampire. Now, I'm not saying that this is fictional, but I will say that the details surrounding this are rather few. There is no file stating how modern this modern vampire was or how it came to be in their possession, but I mean, it's definitely very intriguing. My only question is, where is this so-called vampire now? Was it killed or is it roaming free? Should we be nervous that a bloodthirsty monster could be on the loose or was it more of a twilight vampire situation? I guess we will never know. Coming in at number eight, the famous music box. If you have seen The Conjuring, which by the way, if you haven't, you really should, then you will definitely recognize this next item here. In the film version of the story, the youngest child of the family, April, finds an antique music box in the house and uses it to communicate with the spirit of a young boy named Rory, who was supposedly killed by his mother, Bathsheba, in the 1800s. Now, of course, there are definitely larger things at play throughout the film, but at the end of it, viewers see Ed place the haunted music box inside of the room of artifacts, where it suddenly opens and begins to play its tinny music. Now, in real life, it didn't quite happen like that, but the real music box is safely tucked away in the Warrens Museum. However, legend has it that while it really does contain an evil spirit, it was not properly contained, and so some believe the demon could escape at any moment. Number seven, Medici Chapels. This one begins with an epic discovery, okay? Back in 1975, the director of the Medici Chapels Museum in Florence, Italy, was searching for a new exit route for visitors. He was trying to expand whilst controlling traffic a little bit more, right? We love big moves. Now, in doing so, the director himself stumbled across this trap door beneath a closet. There also lies a few clues on the walls. There are sketches and drawings, the style of which seems to belong to one Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, this is pretty big news. This room was immediately closed for renovations. It was held a secret until 2020. So for many, of course, this is still widely unknown. So I hope you learned a thing or two so far in this list. If you live in the area, go check out some ancient trap doors in Italy. There you go. Number six, secret insect room. If you're in Liverpool and you love insects, oh boy, do I have just the tea for you. Let's go. Inside the World Museum in Liverpool lies a secret room and inside it contains around a million insects. Don't worry, don't worry. These ones are dead this time around. This collection began back in 1855. The 13th Earl of Derby, he's like, you know what? I need a cupboard full of shiny bugs. Let's make it happen, gang. Yeah, let's do it. Thousands of specimens now hide in this room, including the world's largest beetle and a moth with the largest wingspan. Big old shirt with wings, there you go. Imagine night at the museum, but it takes place in the World Museum in London. Bugs everywhere. Ben Stiller would not make it out. No way. There would not be three sequels. Number five, restricted Aboriginal art. While some collections are kept out of sight for museum visitors because they're, you know, extremely scandalous in nature or they're live bugs, others are kept in secret rooms out of respect. In the National Museum of Australia, David Kaus, senior curator of the museum's Aboriginal programs, he wrote this long report explaining the choice to hide these artifacts from history. Now, David himself has said, and I quote, that it is the responsibility of museums to respect the cultures they want to depict. The public use of Aboriginal secrets and or sacred objects is not consistent with this responsibility, end quote. In order to gain access to these restricted Aboriginal objects, these beautiful pearl shell ornaments, you need permission from traditional Aboriginal custodians. Can't just get a fast pass and go take a peek. Not that easy, my friends. Number four, Vatican secrets. Vatican archives are 53 miles long, so there's a lot of secrets hiding down there, okay? There's around 35,000 volumes of catalog. The Vatican secret archives are no joke. They're very real, but in order to see them for yourselves, it's gonna take some time. You gotta earn it, okay? Again, you can't just beep fast pass your way in. The indexes are not public, hence why I'm including them in this list. Only highly respected scholars can access it after they're 75 years old. Their official purpose is to house holy official paperwork and of course it's a treasure trove of anything and everything related to the Pope as well as these long lost ancient documents because I mean because where else do you safely store a letter from Mary Queen of Scots right? Dudes are out here hucking cakes at the Mona Lisa. Yeah we're gonna keep these ancient notes locked up I think. No one's gonna be hucking cakes at this one. Queen Mary of Scots was killed after serving roughly 20 years in custody but eventually she was sentenced to death for conspiring to kill Queen Elizabeth I. But before she met her untimely fate she wrote a letter 
letter to Pope Sixtus V, literally begging for her life in this letter. But of course, as we now know, the Pope did not intervene, and on February 8th, 1587, Mary Queen of Scots was executed. Now, when it comes to cursed items withheld from the public, this note is definitely up there. There's also a secret room that contains the 200 foot tall Tower of the Winds, only accessible through these secret archives, so we're never gonna see them. Number three. King Tut's Cursed Artifacts. The new Grand Egyptian Museum was set to open in 2018, and then finally it did in 2021. And while that's quite recent, the contents displayed inside certainly are not. For the first time in history, King Tut's ancient belongings, like all of them discovered with him, will now be on display. Now prior to this museum being open, we only saw 150 artifacts from his tomb. They took all these pieces out on tour, like their kiss or something. But now this museum will house thousands of artifacts. We could all go and see it in one place. There's over 7,000 square meters and it's quite a display. If you have a chance to visit the Grand Egyptian Museum or if you saw this King Tut world tour on the road, I'm jealous because many of these artifacts were held aside from the public because they were deemed cursed. So if you visit, uh, don't touch anything, please. Number two. Deathly Pearls. If you've seen the movie Annabelle Comes Home, this next secret room in a secret museum should ring a bell. Character Daniela in the movie, she tries to communicate to a loved one beyond the grave. Now, in order to do so, she puts on a bracelet from Ed and Lorraine's Occult Museum. Now, there isn't a mourning bracelet in the real Occult Museum, but there is such a thing as the Pearls of Death, and you cannot touch them, obviously. These are very real and they are very locked up. And they're also very lovely, might I add. I think they would look fabulous on me. These pearls were added to the museum after a woman claimed they were strangling her by themselves. The second this poor woman put these pearls on, she needed people around her to help yank the pearls from her neck. Yeah, these haunted pearls have nothing on Martha Wayne. Don't touch them. And finally, number one, a secret bowling alley. We'll end this list on a fun note because it's almost Friday and I'm here to have fun. And because this is probably the coolest one on this list, in my personal opinion. The Frick Collection resides in the former home of Henry Frick, of course. This is on Manhattan's Upper East Side. A handful of you have probably been here. Again, I'm jealous. This collection is a museum in itself. It contains paintings, sculptures, furniture, all historical, and all made from European artists from as far back as the 13th century. The mansion itself is rather new. That was built in 1913, and of course, it was also used as the Frick's family residence. A rich family in the early 1900s. You already know there's some secret rooms, right? Areas closed off to the public, but what's hiding in there, right? What are we missing? Well, we're missing fun, rich family stuff. Like, you know, a two-lane bowling alley built in 1914, and a billiards room, and a wood shop, and even a tiny diner, in case you get hungry. You and your rich purge family, you can go eat in a secret diner. There you go, enjoy it, 1900s. Number 10, Café du Monde. Café du Monde is probably one of the most well-known places on this list, mostly for having what many people say are the best beignets in town. But there can be a problem with the service. Nope, not from the employees, I'm sure that they're amazing. But apparently, some people give their order to a waiter only to never have it arrive, or see the waiter again. Since the restaurant is open 24 hours a day, some customers have seen some freaky things at night, including a ghost waiter who has been haunting the place for decades. No one knows who they might have been, but they must have loved their job a whole lot if they keep coming back to work after they've passed on. Or maybe they worked themselves to death and can't escape the horrors of the night shift. As someone with a lot of restaurant experience, I feel bad for not only the ghostly server, but for the folks who never got their orders. Number nine, the old French opera house. Uh, before we move on to number nine, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons so that I can keep bringing you the most amazing videos. While it no longer stays stands today and many bars and businesses take up the space where it once was, the witch of the opera house still lurks in the area of her final resting place. Her story begins in the 1860s. Her name was Marguerite and she made quite a splash during her debut, but not because she was a good singer, apparently she wasn't, but it was because of her beauty. After a while, people began to see through her and they realized that beauty wasn't enough to carry a show and her career dried up. Financially ruined after losing her career and husband due to a sudden accident, Marguerite decided to fall back and open a bakery. But there was a problem she couldn't bake. So she sent for the best Parisian pastry chef that she could find, and he came to work for her. And he was pretty easy on the eyes. They fell for each other and they were happy for years. Then one day she heard that her new husband was cheating on her and had a second apartment that they used as a love nest. Enraged, she went to the apartment in the middle of the night, turned on the gas in the fireplace and left with the gas leaking out. The chef and the mistress suffocated and Marguerite broke into the opera house and hung herself from the chandelier in her old costume, which she'd stolen from the production. They say that you can still hear her and see her screaming for her lost love in the street where the opera house once stood. 
Number 8. The Old Absinthe House It was originally built in 1752, but burned down in the Great Friday Fire of 1788. When it was rebuilt, it became a place for people to meet and discuss less than savory topics, and have some absinthe, a very strong alcohol that was said to have hallucinogenic properties. While many people gathered for drinks here, there was one meeting that took place that was instrumental in American history. According to the legend, in 1815, General Andrew Jackson called for a meeting with someone you wouldn't expect, a notorious pirate by the name of Jean Lafitte. Now, why was a general meeting with a pirate? Well, he needed help with the impending battle with the British for the city, and he knew that Jean knew the city and its surrounding swamps and waters like the back of his hand. In exchange for full pardons, Jackson had Jean's army of pirates released from jail so that they could assist with the war, and they actually helped him turn the tide of what became known as the Battle for New Orleans. Lafitte can still be seen at his favorite spot in the bar on the second floor, wearing his hat and indulging himself with food and drink. Others have spotted the ghosts of Andrew Jackson, as well as Marie Laveau and Madame Lalaurie, both of whom we'll talk about in a little while. With all of these spirits around and reports of slamming doors, footsteps, and flying bottles, I'd stay away from here. Coming in at number 7, tombstones. When it comes to items involved in a satanic ritual, I am sure that the Warrens managed to corner that market. I mean, are there other haunted museums? Absolutely, but theirs is really the one that started it all. One of these allegedly satanically involved items you can find hiding about are a series of tombstones that the Warrens claim were used in a dark occult ritual by those who work on the darker side of the paranormal. However, what makes these tombstones especially creepy is that they reportedly belong to rather young people. And so the Warrens had reason to believe that the young people were not not only used as a sacrifice, but then their tombstones were used to finalize the ritual. So, you know, just all around very dark and evil stuff. Coming in at number six, a brick. It's not all Hollywood-based sensations inside the museum. In fact, one of their most prized and feared possessions looks about as plain as you could imagine. It's a brick. Like, from a house. But of course, this is no ordinary brick. It's in an occult museum after all. This brick in particular was from the Borley Rectory, a now famous building that was demolished in 1944 after it was badly damaged in a fire. But what made it such a sensation was that prior to the 1939 fire, it had long been rumored to be the most haunted building in all of the United Kingdom which is a pretty tall order considering how many allegedly haunted buildings span across the UK. Allegedly, the night of the fire, there were over 2,000 reports of paranormal activity, including floating bricks thought to have been possessed by a poltergeist. So if rumors are true, that would make this brick probably the most terrifying brick ever. Which I mean, I don't know how much competition it really has there, but still, it's a demonic brick. It's terrifying no matter what. Coming in at number five, Pearls of Death. While it's probably a pretty safe blanket rule that you shouldn't go around touching much of anything you find in Ed and Lorraine's demonic collection, some stuff is probably a little worse than others. And this next one falls into the latter category. Notoriously one of the most dangerous items found inside the museum, the Pearls of Death is a cursed necklace said to do exactly as the name suggests. Allegedly, anyone who dares place them around their neck will be choked and suffocated to death. Now, my question about this necklace is, is it like a Frodo and the Ring style situation where it will call to you, slowly infecting your brain through mind control until it practically forces you to place it around your neck? Or does it just wait for someone to unknowingly do it before it unleashes all hell on the victim? I guess I will never know, because you can bet I won't be testing it out for myself. Coming in at number four, The Conjuring Mirror. Despite what the name would have you believe, The Conjuring Mirror actually has really nothing to do with The Conjuring movies. Instead, this haunted mirror gets its name from the fact that it was, at one point, allegedly used to summon or conjure spirits. 
once in the possession of a man named Stephen Zellner. Legend has it that Stephen practiced a kind of witchcraft known as catoprotromancy, I probably butchered that, in order to see into the future and seek out revenge on his enemies. However, the more that Stephen used the mirror, the more and more corrupt he and his use of the magic became. Eventually, it's said the evil spirits he had conjured to do his bidding became too powerful to control and turned on the very person who had summoned them. Soon, Stephen began fearing for his life, so as a last resort, he decided to reach out to a local priest to see if the evil spirits could be exorcised from the home. But instead, the priest put him in touch with Ed and Lorraine. Upon their arrival at Stephen's home, they immediately knew Stephen was in grave trouble. And so to keep him safe, they performed a reverse incantation spell to seal up all the spirits back inside the mirror from which they had been conjured. Afterwards, Stephen begged them to take the mirror away from him, and that is how it came to live in Ed and Lorraine's museum. However, don't get too comfortable. Despite the spell they cast, Ed and Lorraine still claim to have experienced many terrifying moments with the spirits they angered from trapping inside the smear. And who knows what could bring them back out. Coming in at number three, the shadow doll. When it comes to creepy dolls, I'll be honest, it doesn't take much to freak me out. But with that being said, there is definitely a very good reason why the shadow doll is one of the most feared possessions in the entire museum. Now, what starts off this seemingly endless list of creepy things about this doll is that there is no definitive answer as to why it was created or who created it. But according to Ed and Lorraine's files, it was made using both human and animal bones and was absolutely used in satanic rituals. So it is definitely possessed by some less than ideal company. Said to have been found in an antique shop by a couple, they began to think something was wrong after they kept waking up night after night covered in inexplicable scratches. But it wasn't until the doll began showing up in their nightmares, telling them that she was going to kill them, that they decided to get rid of the terrifying toy. And good thing they did too. Legend has it that if someone takes a picture of this doll, she will visit you in your dreams and kill you in your sleep. Just one more reason to never trust a creepy doll. Coming in at number two, a satanic idol. As the story goes, in 1991, a hunter was walking through the woods on the lookout for deer when he began to feel an overwhelming sense of paranoia, like he was being watched or something. At that very moment, he turned around to see this creepy doll leaned up against a tree, staring at him, and he could have sworn that it appeared out of nowhere. Immediately, the hunter knew he should not be here, and so he began walking as quickly as he could to find a way out of the forest. Then suddenly, an old man dressed in all black robes appeared beside him. He looked like a priest, the hunter thought, but something wasn't quite right. Every step he took, the priest matched him, and eventually he became so freaked out, he actually debated shooting at the priest with his arrow to scare him off. But instead, he decided to ask the priest how to get out of the forest. But creepily, the priest did not speak. Instead, he pointed off into another direction, turned around, and left the man alone once again. Now, luckily, the hunter escaped, and the following day, after telling his friends the strange events, they suggested that he reach out to Ed and Lorraine. Upon telling them his story, they explained that the priest was a well-known leader of a satanic cult, and that the creepy doll he had encountered was actually an idol used for ritual purposes. However, the Warrens, being who they were, wanted to get this idol for the museum, and so Ed ventured into the forest, found the doll, and brought it back home. Soon after, however, strange things began happening. Allegedly, one time Ed was speaking with Lorraine, turned away for a second, looked back, and she was suddenly 30 feet away and passed out on the ground. He called the ambulance, and she spent the next three days in hospital in and out of consciousness. And according to Ed, she actually levitated while in the hospital. The Warrens always firmly believed that the satanic priest was working through the doll Ed had taken from the forest and was trying to punish them for taking it. Let's just hope no one was ever hospitalized after that. 
And last up in our number one spot, Annabelle. You didn't really think I was gonna do a list about haunted things found in Ed and Lorraine's museum and not bring up the famous Annabelle, did you? Although nowadays she is locked up tight, this wasn't always the case. Back in 1970, Annabelle was gifted to a nursing student named Donna, but it didn't take long before Donna and her roommate Angie knew that something was off. After about a month, the roommates began finding disturbing messages lying around their apartment, warning them to help Lou. Lou was one of their friends who had apparently warned the girls of the doll since day one. Eventually, things got so creepy that the woman contacted a medium who told them not to be afraid that the doll was merely possessed by a young girl named Annabelle Higgins who had died on the property years prior. The medium advised them that Annabelle felt safe here and would like to stay, so they agreed. But that was all a part of the demon's plan. Not long after, Lou stayed over and when he awoke from a nightmare, he found he couldn't move his body. And then like straight out of a horror movie, he says Annabelle walked up his body and strangled him until he passed out. After that, the girls contacted a priest who put them in touch with paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren, who discredited the medium and said it was, in fact, a very dangerous demon possessing this doll. However, even now, despite being locked up, the doll should be deeply feared. It was reported once that a man who visited the museum mocked the doll and only a few days later died after losing control of his motorbike. So, yeah. She very well could be the most terrifying doll on the planet. First up in our number 10 spot, the Hands Resist Him painting. As far as paintings go, the Hands Resist Him is probably considered one of the most haunted pieces in the whole world. William Stoneham, the creator, claims the inspiration for the piece came from an old photograph. And somehow, over time, it landed in the hands of a California couple. As the story goes, the sellers who auctioned it on eBay in 2000 kept the painting in their daughter's room. But one morning, the girl claimed that the people in the painting were not letting her sleep at night. So for the girl's peace of mind, they set up a motion sensor camera to prove that no monsters were coming out of the painting. However, to their surprise, they captured some truly frightening activity. They awoke to find photos of the boy crawling from the painting and others where the doll's face had changed to a very angry disposition while holding a weapon. Not only that, it's also rumored to have been responsible for the death of three different men who came into contact with the piece at one time or another. Today you can find it hidden in the back room of Smith's Perception Fine Art Gallery in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but be warned, those that witness the painting often complain of nausea or extreme physical pain while in its presence. Moving on to number nine, Wheelie. Some say it's a stuffed dog, while others say it looks more like a sheep, but Either way, it's an old, creepy, haunted toy from the 19th century that can be found in the Prince Edward Island Museum in Canada. Nicknamed Wheelie due to the creaky wheels the stuffed animal sits on top of, this nearly 200-year-old toy was found lying inside the walls of the Yeo House while construction was underway. According to the staff, the disfigured sheep dog toy was simply lying on the ground inside the walls, and so they decided to keep it and put it out on display for their visitors, which would all be well and fine except for the fact that it may have been hidden in a wall for a reason. Apparently, Wheelie is known to wander around all by himself and is often found hiding in a different spot than he was left the night before. So again, maybe best to put him back where he was found. Moving on to number eight. Delphi Purple Sapphire. The Delphi Purple Sapphire was a beloved stone once held safely in the Temple of Indra. That was until English Colonel W. Ferris looted it from the temple during the Indian Rebellion in 1857 and brought it back with him to England. However, Ferris soon regretted this decision as he quickly began losing his fortune and his entire family started facing bad luck at every turn. At first, the family blamed the financial hit on a bad investment, but after one of their friends took their own life after holding the stone in their hands, they began to fear that some unseen force could be sabotaging them. Afterwards, the following owner, Edward Heron Allen, had such bad luck that he tried three times to get rid of the stone by throwing it in the nearby river, only for it to make its way back into his possession each 
time. Eventually Edward decided to lock up the stone in a box in an attempt to seal its powers away, but London's National Museum of History got wind of this so called cursed stone and Edward gave in, giving it to them provided they did not open the box until three years after his death and that his daughter may never be permitted to touch it. The museum followed the strict instructions and waited before setting it out on display, but they quickly discovered Edward was not exaggerating. The museum curator who handled the stone a total of three times says each time something awful has happened, and so it's remained hidden ever since. In our number seven spot, we have the Faulkner House. William Faulkner was a Nobel Prize winning author who wrote many amazing works, including The Sound and the Fury and As I Lay Dying. Faulkner moved to this house on Pirate's Alley in the 1920s, and it's actually where he wrote his first novel, A Soldier's Pay. The house was bought by a couple in 1990 and turned into a bookstore, but apparently Faulkner never left. Visitors report the smell of pipe smoke, which the author was smoking constantly, while the new owners were not, as well as books falling off the shelves, usually books written by him. I feel like buying a haunted book is just a recipe for trouble, even if it's a classic. Number 6. Le Petit Theatre Established in 1916, this theatre has been the host to many plays and performers over the years, but one has become more infamous than the rest. In 1930s, many plays were coming through, touring the South, and one of them was led by a performer called Caroline. Her last name has been lost to time. Right before a performance, she decided to go for a walk outside on the theatre's balcony and tragically fell over the rail and lost her life. Now, visitors of the theatre who go stand in the spot she fell from report a sudden drop in temperature and feel a pull towards the edge. Some people also say that they've seen Caroline's reflection in the water of the theatre's fountain, still in costume, ready to go on stage. What is it with Nola and haunted theatres? <laughs> Number 5. Sultan's Palace In 1839, Jean-Baptiste Le Prêtre purchased a lavish half-story mansion from a struggling dentist as a new home for his brother, who just so happened to be a sultan from a far-off land. When the sultan arrived by ship, he brought with him a harem of wives, eunuchs, and all sorts of lavish furniture, all of which paraded through the street on their way to the house. Townspeople who lived nearby heard all-night parties and the smell of smoke emanating from within the palace and were put off that they were never invited. But one day a man was walking by and he saw something shocking, blood dripping down the front steps and forming a pool in the street. The man fled to a police station to tell them about what he'd found and when the police arrived they saw quite a grisly scene. Bodies were lying all over the floor, some with missing limbs, some cut open and broken as though some sort of beast had torn them apart. But the most disturbing find was in the courtyard, where through the wet soil a hand was reaching up but not moving as if whoever belonged to it was asking for help after being buried alive. When they dug him up, they recognized him as the Sultan himself. The case was never solved, but it was believed to be the brother's doing that caused the horrors, as his body was never found, and he had the most to gain from the Sultan's death. Number 4. Pharmacy Museum Now, I know a pharmacy museum doesn't sound that exciting, but stay with me here. In 1823, Louis de Filo, the nation's first licensed pharmacist, opened a pharmacy where the museum now stands and ran it successfully for years. But in 1855, he sold it to Dr. Joseph Dupas, who lived there until he died of syphilis in 1867. But it seems that he got what he deserved. Dr. Dupas allegedly was performing shocking experiments on pregnant slaves, as well as other horrible things like poisoning with what he told people was medicine. It is said that his spirit is doomed to haunt the museum where some of the remnants of his grotesque experiments still remain, and visitors have reported seeing him in a brown suit, throwing books, and even pushing people to the ground. He seems like a vengeful spirit, so stay away from here. Number 3. Marie Laveau's House Marie Laveau is perhaps one of the most well-known and allegedly most powerful voodoo practitioners of all time. Born in 1794, she was the student and successor of Dr. John, a voodoo priest who was supposedly an African prince from Senegal. She would often conduct business in Congo Square, earning the favor of slaves by giving them charms, cures, and even spells in return for information on their masters. She used this information when the masters requested her services to impress them in a simpler way before showing her true power and conducting rituals. The house where she lived was also said to be a meeting place for people where they performed chants and rituals late into the night. The house was torn down in 1903 but a new structure, which is now a vacation rental, was built on the same foundations and some say that that's how her spirit still remains in the house. One couple recounted the story of their stay where late one night they heard 
chanting and drumming. They checked outside, but there was no one there. When they realized the sounds were coming from the empty living room, they decided to not sleep there that night. Good call. When they returned the next morning, there was a single pristine feather lying in the middle of the living room, but all of the doors and the windows were locked tight. They checked out immediately and never returned. Because to a voodoo practitioner, a feather is good luck. But to an unsuspecting person, it is an omen of death or a hex having been placed upon you. So stay away from here if you don't wish to be cursed. Number two, St. Louis Cemetery number one. Established in 1789, this cemetery is New Orleans' oldest extant gravesite and is also considered one of the most haunted cemeteries in the US. With over 700 tombs and over 100 thousand dead buried here, it makes sense that there would be some spirits that hung around. While most ghosts are said to haunt the places that they died, and not their graves, something about this place draws them in. And there are some very famous ones who reside here. Allegedly, our good friend Marie Laveau is seen here more often than anywhere else, though some claim that she still lives after creating an immortality potion, and she comes here, where her tomb also resides, to communicate with the dead, only to be mistaken for a spirit. It's said that if you place three X's on on her tomb, your wish will be granted, and if it is, you must return and place a gift, or you will face the consequences. Some people report falling ill here, sudden bruises or cuts appearing, and hearing voices. Other spirits of the cemetery include that of a sailor, whose family tomb was sold out from under him while on the high seas, and he's looking for somewhere to rest his soul. And finally, we reach number one, the house of Madame Delphine Lalaurie. Delphine was a wealthy woman of high stature, who married into even more riches and a grand house. She was also played by Kathy Bates in season 3 of American Horror Story. Her and her husband were often heard screaming and arguing all the way from the street, and he eventually left her, after finding out some of her dark secrets. Lanary was a monstrous woman who performed terrible experiments on slaves that worked in her house, and her world came crashing down when a fire started in her home. When men arrived to put the fire out, they found many horrors in the attic. They found seven slaves who were suspended by the neck and stretched and bent into horrible positions which they were bound into. Some had pieces of skin flayed off or missing limbs, and one woman had apparently had her bones broken such that she could be fit into a box. Delphine fled the city that night and never returned, but it's said that the ghosts of those who were mutilated there haunt the house looking for their revenge. A man who lived there in the 1900s heard the voices telling him to do horrible things, and eventually he took his own life, proving that the spirits want no one to enter the house where such atrocities happened. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Anna Baker's wedding dress. In 1836, a man named Elias Baker purchased a mansion in Altoona, Pennsylvania and moved his small family in. Elias's oldest daughter was named Anna, and when she fell in love with a steel worker, things took a dark turn. Anna's father didn't want her dating this man, but she kept doing it in secret. The story goes that Anna and the man planned a secret wedding and were going to elope. Unfortunately, Elias found out and freaked out. He apparently purchased the steel mill that the man worked for and then forced him to have to move to an entirely different city so as to prevent him from being able to continue seeing Anna. Anna of course was furious with her father and I'm sure this was only made worse by his decision to offer other men to her, to which she of course declined because that's just weird. Anna instead locked herself in a room with her wedding dress that she never got to wear. Anna unfortunately never married after that and spent the rest of her life being terribly upset about the whole incident. After her death, it is said that her anger and despair ended up going into the wedding dress. Members of the Baker family reported seeing the dress in different places around the house, despite no one moving it themselves. Some have even reported seeing Anna's spirit dressed in the gown around the house as well. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Golden Eagle. This car was a 1964 Dodge 330 limited edition, and it has been blamed for the death of around 14 people, which, like, how do we even let it get that out of control? It is said that the car started out as a police car originally, but there were three officers assigned to this car who all ended up taking their lives and other people's lives in horrible ways. Not in the car, but still super weird that this all seemed to happen after they had been using the cars for work. Because of this strange correlation, it ended up being sold off to another man. Throughout the 80s and 90s, it is said that because of the rumored cursed car, it became a point of interest for vandals. People began vandalizing the car only to meet their own untimely 
untimely fates which were all met in strange ways. For example, it was said that one vandal died from being struck by lightning. It is said that the curse is so strong that one person decided to merely touch the car and it sent him into madness as he went on to commit atrocious crimes after that that I cannot even detail here on YouTube. The car now belongs to Wendy Allen who supposedly collects and decorates haunted cars for a living, so it seems as though it's finally found its home. Far, far, far away from anyone else. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Blarney Stone. For hundreds of years, the Blarney Stone has resided within Blarney Castle, which is near Cork, Ireland. The stone is a piece of limestone, and legend says that those who give the stone a smooch will then be given the gift of the gab. This little smooch can bestow the power of being able to talk your way out of any situation, which would be incredibly useful, but there are those who always try to indulge in too much of a good thing. The issues start when you attempt to take a piece of the stone, no matter how small, away from a its home. Those who don't follow the rules and take the stone end up being cursed with bad luck. Every year the castle receives parcels from greedy tourists who tried their luck at stealing portions of the stone. These parcels are returned with the intention of lifting the curse of misfortune. It is said that once the stone is returned, the curse will be lifted, which is most definitely good news. So I guess the moral of this curse, however, is to not be greedy and to just follow the rules. Moving on to number 7. Peter Curtin's head. Hidden in the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Wisconsin is one of the most haunting objects you could come across. The severed head of a dead man. But who's the guy? Well, none other than the vampire of Dusseldorf, Peter Curtin. To give you a bit of context, Peter Curtin is widely considered one of the most cruel and deranged men of the 20th century. Between 1913 to 1929, he was a rampant killer and predator, responsible for the death of 10 people and attempted another 31 killings among his 68 crimes total. While in court, he received the nickname Vampire of Dusseldorf for reasons I'm sure you can imagine. And after freely confessing to all his crimes with no remorse, he was sentenced to execution via the guillotine. But his atrocities did not end there. In fact, shortly before he was executed, he famously turned to his psychiatrist and asked, quote, Tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck. That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. Following his beheading, his head was then bisected and his brain was removed in order to be studied. The rest of his head, however, was mummified, transferred to the United States, and tucked away for everyone's safety. Moving on to number six, women from Lem statue. Nicknamed the goddess of death, this cursed limestone statue was first unearthed in 1878 in in Lem, Cyprus. Estimated to date back to somewhere around 3500 BC, it's unknown who created the statue or what purpose it may have been for, but it is believed to have been owned by four different families, all of whom died within a few years of obtaining the artifact. The first was Lord Elfont, who six years after acquiring the statue died along with all seven members of his family. Next was Ivor Minucci, whose entire family died within four years, followed by Lord Thompson Knoll, whose family perished within four years. For a while after that, the statue seemingly vanished until it wound up in the hands of Sir Alan Biverbrook and his family, who as I'm sure you can predict, all died within a few years. After the last family died, there were two remaining family members who somehow managed to escape the deathly fate, and terrified of the powers the statue possessed, they donated it to the Royal Scottish Museum, where it now rests. But before it was safely stowed away, it took one last life as the museum curator who handled the statue died within the year of touching it. Thank God no one else has touched it since. Moving on to number five. Robert the Doll. In 1904, a boy named Robert Eugene received a doll as a present from his grandfather. Robert was so excited about the gift that he even named the doll after himself. Almost immediately, his parents felt like something wasn't right. They claimed they would hear Robert speaking to his doll at night and that a strange voice would answer back. As time went on, Robert got more and more attached and his parents began noticing that his behavior was changing for the worse. When they would notice something strange like furniture 
furniture in a different room or objects scattered around the house, Robert would get extremely defensive and blame everything on the doll. However, things only got creepier as Robert got older. He kept the doll even as an adult and brought it to his new home with his wife. Neighbors that walked past said the doll was always looking out the window in the attic and would watch you as you walked by, often changing his expression as if he was taunting you. Years later, when Robert and his wife died, the new owner found the doll in the attic and said that every night they could hear eerie giggling coming from above. From there, it said the doll was donated to a museum in Florida, locked behind glass, and hidden from the public. Coming in at number four. Hope Diamond. As the legend goes, back in 1666, a French merchant obtained this beautiful blue diamond after illegally plucking the gem from a Hindu idol and selling it to King Louis XIV, a sacrilegious crime for which he was later mauled to death by dogs for committing. But fast forward a few years to the French Revolution, and the cursed gem was allegedly stolen again, this time disappearing for years, only to reappear in the 1800s. For years, experts questioned where this jewel had been hidden, but their curiosity was short-lived as soon the jewel wasted no time ruining lives of those it interacted with, and has routinely been blamed for several tragedies over the years. Some of the misfortunes include the loss of great fortune, people's deaths, and people taking their own lives, while some even say Marie Antoinette's death could have been linked to her possession of the cursed diamond. Nowadays, this cursed object is safely stowed away as part of the Smith Smithsonian Institution, so let's just hope it's never found and stolen again. Otherwise, who knows what could be unleashed. Moving on to number three, Busby Chair. As the story goes, Thomas Busby was strangely obsessed and protective of this beloved chair, and killed his father-in-law after he found him sitting in it without permission. Before his execution was finalized, Thomas was given one final request, and he chose to have one last drink in his chair. And according to legend, his last words were, may death come to anyone who dares sit in my chair. Now of course, no one took this entirely seriously at first. He was a man facing death and was bound to spew a concerning thing or two. Plus, he was known to be a liar and a killer, so no one really took his words to heart. That was until people actually started dying. After Busby's death, multiple reports arose of one tragedy after another, and each of them came from someone who had sat in the killer's beloved chair. One man was found hanging outside the Busby Stoop Inn after sitting in the chair, and many soldiers who sat in the chair during World War II died days later. But nowadays, for the safety of everyone, the chair lives in England Thirsk Museum, hanging from the ceiling so that no one else can ever accidentally be cursed by the evil seat. Coming in at number two, Nabrak. In 17th century Iceland, there was a well-known witchcraft ritual where people would create pants out of the skin of the deceased in hopes of a better life for them and their families moving forward. Called nabrok, meaning corpse breeches, or more commonly referred to as necro pants nowadays, the pants were made as a talisman to magically summon more money for whoever made them. However, there was a catch. The man in question had to have consented before death, and the deed could only be done after the burial had taken place. Once loved ones said their goodbyes, you were free to dig up the corpse and peel off the skin, being careful to keep it all in one piece. It was believed that no holes or tears could occur, otherwise the power of the necropants would be lost. But disgustingly, it didn't stop there. Once you had fashioned the pants and put them on your person, the ritual demanded you head out into the village and steal one coin from a destitute widow. From there, the coin was to be placed in the groin of the pants, along with a traditional Icelandic sigil for the ritual to be complete. There is only one known pair of such pants remaining today, and it's hidden in the Museum of Icelandic Sorcery and Witchcraft. And if you ask me, they are just about the most 
terrifying thing I can think of. And last up in our number one spot, the devil's rocking chair. In the early 1950s, the Glatzel family received this rocking chair, but by the summer of 1980, this piece of furniture would play a role in an exorcism so famous they made a movie about it. Long story short, young David Glatzel began seeing visions of what he described was a man with big black eyes, a thin face with animal features, jagged teeth, pointed ears, horns, and hooves. Soon after, David was believed to be possessed by the demon living inside the cursed chair, and that is when Ed and Lorraine Warren became involved. Then in comes Arn Johnson, the fiance of David's older sister, Debbie, who allegedly during the final exorcism told the demon to leave the boy alone and come into him. As legend has it, the demon moved into Arn, who then shortly after was convicted for killing his landlord, stating in his confession that the devil had made him do it. From there, the cursed chair stayed in Ed and Lorraine's museum for many, many years until Zach Bagan bought it from them. However, in 2019, Zach closed down the exhibit and hid the chair away after too many terrifying supernatural encounters. 